Έψον τραύματα Ιησού και γλυκανών την καρδία μου πολύ ελεδέομαι. Ιησού σωτήρ μου ή να μεγαλύνω σε σωζόμενος. Δόξα Σύ ο Θεός ημών δόξα Σύ Ιησού γλυκύτατε Χριστέ Ιησού διάνοιξον της μετανοίας μη πύλας φιλάνθρωπε Ιησού και δέξε με Συ προσπίπτοντα και θερμός εξετούμενον Ιησού σωτήρ μου των πλημελημάτων την συγχώρηση. Δόξα Συ ο Θεός ημών δόξα Συ Ιησού γλυκύτατε Χριστέ Ιησού εξάρπασον εκ της χειρός του δολίου βελίαρμε Ιησού και πίσον δεξιών παραστάτην της δόξης σου Ιησού σωτήρ μου μοίρας ευωνή μου λυτρωσάμενος. Υπέρ Αγία Θεοτό και σωσώνη μας, Ιησούν γεννήσας αθεών, δέσποινα δυσόπισον, υπέρ αχρίων ή και τον πανάχραντε, όπως της κολάσεως τες πρεσβείες σου λυτρωθόμενα μόλυντε. Είμαι μολυσμένη δόξης αηδίου απολαύσαντες. Δόξα Σύ ο Θεός ημών δόξα Σύ εις ακούσω φιλάνθρωπε Ιησού μου του δούλου σου βοόντος εν κατανοίξει και ρίσε Ιησού με της καταδίκης και της κολάσεως μονέ μακρόθυμε Ιησού γλυκύτατε πολύ έλε. Δόξα Σύ ο Θεός ημών δόξα Σύ υπόδεξε τον δούλον Σου Ιησού μου προσπίπτοντα συνδάκρυσιν Ιησού μου και σώσον Ιησού μου μετανοούντα και της γέννης με δέσποτα λύτρωσε Ιησού γλυκύτατε πολύ έλε Δόξα Σύ ο Θεός, ημών δόξα Σύ των χρόνων Ιησού μου ον δε δοκάσμι εις πάθη εδαπάνησα Ιησού μου διό με Ιησού μου μη απορρίψεις αλλά να καλέσε Δεό με δέσποτα Ιησού γλυκύτατε και διάσωσο Υπέρ Αγία Θεοτόκε σώσον ημάς 
παρθένε η τεκούσα των Ιησούν μου η κέτευε ριστίνε με της γέννης η μόνη προστασία των θλιβωμένων Θεοχαρητώτε και καταξίωσον τη ζωή πανάμομε τη αγύρωμε. Σωτήρ μου ίσο τον άσο τον σώσας Σωτήρ μου ίσο ο δεξαμένος πόρνην καμένην ελέησον Ιησού πόλη Περόκτηρας τον μανασίν Ιησούν μου ως μόνος φιλάνθρωπος. Δόξα Σύ ο Θεός ημών δόξα Σύ Θεράπευσον Ιησού μου ψυχής μου τα τραύματα Ιησού μου δέομαι και της χειρός με εξάρπασον Ιησού μου εύσπλαχνε του ψυχοφόρου βελίαρ και διάσωσον Δόξα Σύ ο Θεός ημών Σάρα το right hand of the Father and he took our human nature all the way to heaven glory be to God So we'll start tonight with the first question which has to do with the prophecy of Saint Cosmas the Atolos and about the Vio the two Pascalies the two Pascas It's a very unclear prophecy and uh, some people have ascribed it to the freedom, to the liberation of Northern Greece in 1912 because the prophecy uh, specifically says when the two Paschas come together, then the desirable will come. It doesn't talk about the end of times. It talks about some desirable thing for the Greek nation. So I don't think that really pertains to the end of times and uh, I don't think it has to do with any, anything with the Pascha that we had today. Some people say that because we didn't celebrate Pascha uh, as, as we're supposed to this year, we celebrated it during the apodosis during the leave taking of the feast but we didn't even do that because our churches are not even open yet so i don't think that prophecy really has to do anything with what we're going through right now we have another question that says should we flee from parishes which teach that microbes are transferable in our liturgical worship? I will not answer this question right now. It's not an easy matter. I believe that we need to have a lot more counsel. We need to be more patient to see how the Holy Spirit leads us. Let's wait until a few weeks to see what transpires. I believe it's very difficult to split the church. Uh, it is a very difficult thing as we will see tonight during the controversy of the Colivades. That controversy between monks, it took about 50 years to heal. So splits can take uh, place very easily, but they are 
very difficult to heal. The last question for tonight, and the longest one, is would you mind sharing some things on the article of Father Alcibiades Calivas, and more specifically about the reference to Saint Nicodemus? I think that was answered somewhat with a letter that went viral today. I think at this point we have over 1,100 views with only one negative comment. And many thanks to Maria who wrote the letter. I'm not going to mention her last name, not because we're afraid, but because I don't want her to get so, so much congratulations and bravos and have all this go to her head. That's not very wise spiritually. So I'm going to protect her for that reason alone. However, anybody who's curious and they want to know who Maria is, they can email me and I will be happy to disclose her name. She's a very brave young woman and a very, very serious Orthodox. Now, I did help with the uh, theological overview, and I did add several paragraphs after asking her permission, of course, because this is her letter. And now I would like to focus more on the uh, comment of Father Calivas about St. Nicodemus. I would like to read that so everybody knows exactly what has been said and what this is all about. So we learn from St. Nicodemus, I quote, that during plagues, priests were known to use arbitrary methods to administer communion to the sick and dying. In a comment on Canon 28 of the Panthecti Synod, he chides the clergy for using unsuitable methods to deliver communion to the sick. He recommends a more appropriate method, he writes, hence both priests and prelates, bishops, must employ some shift in time of a plague to enable them to administer communion to the sick without violating this canon. So this canon has nothing to do with the footnote of St. Nicodemus the Hagrite. This canon has to do with many, many centuries ago when people were illiterate and they used to take grapes on their holy altar and the illiterate priests were mixing the grapes with the Holy Communion and giving them to the people. And of course, this is, you know, very inappropriate. And with this canon, priests that would do that, they would be excommunicated and defrocked. So this has nothing to do with this canon. The saint is simply elaborating when he is restructuring the Pidalion and explaining these canons. He addresses an issue that was taking place during his time, around 750 AD, well, actually much about 1770, 1780, when he was on Mount Athos. During the time of a plague, again, the priests were very afraid to go to the homes of the people who were sick. So what they would do, the priests would take the holy bread of Holy Thursday night, and they would take this bread and they would place it in a raisin and then they would somehow take it to the home of the person died to the infected infectious person and they would try to give or just pass it to this man and he would take the raisin and eat it and that's and the saint says this is very inappropriate so here he says Do not do this anymore, but uh, by placing the holy bread in raisins, 
but it says don't put it in a raisin and pass it to the to the uh, sick man with some kind of a shovel or something long or but put the holy bread of holy thursday night now we're not talking about a chalice here just the holy bread which has been immersed in the blood of christ and the saint says put it in some sacred vessel some vessel some kind of a metal vessel that you're only going to use for this purpose so you will take it to the dying and the sick so at that point you will use tongues like forceps and commune the person who's ill so after this now here the priest obviously does not have to consume because there's nothing in here there's only one or two three hosts or holy breads because he's communing one or two people in a place or in a home so because the priests are obviously afraid to do this and some of them don't even go and there was times where they would give this uh, this holy bread to the mortis these were people who had the disease and they developed an immunity to it and these people would go and bury the dying and they would also give holy communion to those sick when a priest would not be willing to go so here the main concern of the saying is to try to commune the dying person at all costs and because these people priest whoever gets there they may be afraid then he simply says the vessel then and the tongues are to be placed in vinegar and a vinegar is to be poured into a funnel take it back to the church and pour it through the funnel so here the saint is saying nothing about microbes he's simply suggesting a technique to give holy communion to those dying abandoned in their homes or to some kind of a nursing home which they didn't have those things back then or even a hospital there are no hospitals back then because we are during the years of turkish enslavement so these are very difficult difficult years and the saying is simply making this concession to try to make sure that these dying people uh, become communed and then he tells the priest after that yes use vinegar and wash the vessel and bring it back to the church clean so this has nothing to do with microbes unfortunately father Kalivas misinterprets and actually dishonors the saint by saying that this is an acknowledgement that the vessels or instruments used for communing could be contaminated by dangerous parasitic microbes where do we see this how is this an acknowledgement even today when priests go to a hospital and they commune someone afterwards they want they take a very small chalice i've seen father nicholas do that they take a very small chalice vasili and then after they commune and uh, then they wash this with hot water but back then in his homes there's no you know they they use they use vinegar again because it would it would uh, dispel any kind of fears that the priest or even the lay person that was doing this amortis uh, that would have so once again he's not taking he's not talking about a holy chalice and this is not taking place in the church so certainly nothing to do with microbes so this is to show that there's a great danger when we attempt to use and interpret canons outside of their historical time and reality again these are the dark years of the turkish occupation 
the priests are very few, most mostly illiterate. They work all day in their fields, olive groves, to feed their families. So during a plague, a plague outbreak, some refuse to go give the last rites to the dying. So the saint makes this economia to help them to make sure that the ill and the dying do not go to the other life without the medicine of immortality. And much like today, today, some of our priests and bishops are afraid to go to hospitals. So we have people dying in hospitals without Holy Communion. Now, the unfortunate thing about this is we haven't heard of Father Kalivas for years. He's a great theologian and great priest, but why all of a sudden? And uh, here, with much sadness, we must, we, must, we, must, we must address that His Eminence Archbishop Elpidophoros has done all he can to disappoint us this first year in office. A year ago at St. Demetrius, he told us that heretics are not the Catholics and the Protestants, but those who cause trouble in the church. Who are those? Those who dare to raise their voices when they're trying to defend their faith? A month or two ago, he tried to convince us that it's okay to give Holy Communion to the unbelieving husband or wife married to an Orthodox. We find this highly irresponsible, especially when St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13.30 St. Paul warns, for he who eats and drinks, not discerning the Lord's body, drinks unto, con unto condemnation. For this reason, many of you get sick and die. And this, not for the unbelievers, but for the unworthy, or the, for the unworthy Orthodox who come to receive Holy Communion for good luck to do their good deed and to make their grandma happy. If the, if the church looks at Holy Communion like this for baptized Christians, then how can we possibly even think of the idea that we can give Holy Communion to an unbeliever, to someone who's not Orthodox? The non-Orthodox are not even permitted to be included in the Proscomidi prayers. When we give our names in the altar, when we take our Proscomidi to the church, we write the names of the Orthodox, the deceased, and those who are praying for good health. And it is not permissible to write a name of someone who's not a baptized member of the church. Now, if we can't write their names in the Proscomidi, how can we possibly give Holy Communion to someone who's not Orthodox? And now, unfortunately, he recruited Father Kalivas, known for his thirst for revi revisionism, to try to tell us and convince us that receiving Holy Communion from the spoon is dangerous and includes the possibility of the transmission of parasitic microbes. I think well, enough was said in the letter, but according to this blasphemous anti-Christian catechism, the Church of Christ has been ignorant for the last 2,000 years. It has been using a foolish and ignorant But if we if we accept this position we must conclude that up until the appearance of COVID-19, the faithful were receiving 
the Holy Eucharist in an unsafe manner. So how is our church infallible? Is the, is the Holy Spirit a lazy guy that didn't point this out to one of the saints of our church for the last 2,000 years? And now come Archbishop Elpidophoros and some of his like-minded bishops to correct the church, the Church of Christ. But let's continue with the Colivades who were fighting this very same humanist Western spirit 250 years ago. After the schism, the heresies of the Pope and the falsehoods of that church distance the faithful from the Church of Christ, and many of them seek different kinds of knowledge and we had the birth of the Renaissance. What was the Renaissance? It started in Florence in Italy around 14th century. Again people who were disappointed with Christianity they were looking to reconnect with philosophy with ancient Greece and ancient Greece became once again on a pedestal and all these philosophers, everybody was studying Aristotle. It was called the Renaissance, the rebirth. And after this went on for several centuries, then again, papism brought forth Renaissance. And then the Reformation, the Great Reformation, which even if distant itself even more from the tradition of the church, and totally disconnected people from God. Now we have the age of enlightenment, the age of reason. Because the philosophers taught, Thomas Aquinas and all the Western philosophers and thinkers, they said that, you know, there's really no connection between us and God because, you know, God is essence, we are creatures, so there's no connection. They lost their faith in created, uh, in the uncreated grace of God. So they believe that Christ is up there, he's in heaven, and the Pope is Christ on earth. Of course, the Protestants, everyone became a Pope, and they distanced themselves from the spiritual tradition of the Orthodox Church, which, te which teaches that men can commune with God through God's uncreated energies. We can commune with the uncreated light of God. We can truly have Christ and the Trinity live in our heart. We don't commune with the essence, but we commune with the energies of God. We can become theophory, and we, become, we, can, get, we can get to the point of theosis. Unfortunately, again, all this was lost, and now this death be to God's spirit, the death of God, and all this uh, enlightenment which brought forth the French Revolution and Voltaire, and all this atheism and humanism. So the center of the enlightenment is the men. According to European enlightenment, the measure of all things is men. But according to Orthodox Christianity, the measure of all things is the God-men. So now in during these centuries, we have many Greeks who were opulent. They were sent to Europe. They wanted to obviously avoid the enslavement. And those who had means, they went to Europe and they did very well. They developed businesses and uh, they became successful, but they also wanted to help the, uh, their old country. And one of those uh, main people was Adamandios Corais, who was basically a Voltairist. He loved Voltaire and the uh, lights, the lights of Europe. And their idea was to come back 
and bring all this enlightenment to the country of Greece. Get rid of the monks, get rid of the illiterate priests, get rid of all this old tradition, that's no good. And not surprisingly, after this happened in 1821, when we got, well, when we received our liberation from the Turks, and our first king was Othon from Bavaria. He had to become Orthodox, but his whole cabinet were well, Protestants. The first thing that they did is they closed down 400 monasteries by the help of the Greek police. They, they closed down 400 monasteries, something that the Turks didn't even do for 400 years. A disaster. Because of the humanistic, humanistic spirit that said that we need to really elevate Greece and liberate it from the darkness and the fundamentalism of the monks and, you know, the, uh, the, the priests and, the, and those who don't want to modernize. So this was the spirit around the time of the Colivades. This spirit was coming to Greece from the 15th, 16th century. And the remnant of the church, they saw this spirit and they were fighting the spirit. We had great men like Papulakos, uh, Flamiatos, also, uh, St. Cosmas the Aetolian, they were seeing this spirit. That's what the monks do. They pray constantly, they stay vigilant, and say they see the works of the demons. They were getting ready for this spirit. Unfortunately, whenever we have a crisis like this, the remnant are always the few. Most of the monks and most of the people in Greece, they were buying into the prosperity gospel of Europe. We need the lights of Europe so we can modernize, so we can become a modern country. So in Mount Athos, this spirit was once again being watched very closely. And the cause for this controversy became when the monks of the Skeet of St. Anne at 1754, they decided to make a small revision. A small change, something very minor by today's standards. They needed to build a church. And for, for them to do this, they needed to, uh, they went and had fundraisers. They collected quite a bit of money, but they also collected five, six, seven thousand names of people that they needed to pray and do memorial services for every weekend. So now, for the last 2,000 years, memorial services were only done on Saturday because Saturday Christ was in Hades, and uh, Saturday, I mean, to this day, all the Psychosabata are on Saturdays, right? That's the tradition of the church. We don't have a Psychosabata, we don't have a Psychosunday, we have Psychosabata. So at this point, these monks, they needed to build a church, but by reading these thousands of names on the Saturday liturgy, it would take them to one or two o'clock to finish the liturgy. But then they needed to buy materials to build a church. So they were running very short of time. So they thought this great idea, well, look, it wouldn't hurt too much if we just do the memorial services on Sunday we can do all our work on Saturday, and then on Sunday, we'll do the memorial services. A small change like that, that rocked the entire Mount Athos for over 70 years. It took five patriarchs to resolve this problem. Five patriarchs. It wasn't resolved until eight, uh, 1819 with Gregory V, the Neomarder, who was hanged by the Turks two years later. He mentioned, okay, that's it. We need to resolve this. No one can bring this up again. And he put an anathema that nobody can question this. So he said, 
anyone who wants to do memorial services on Saturday, they are permitted, no problem. That's the tradition of the church. But anyone who's, who wants to do it on Sunday, they need to be left alone. And St. Nicodemo says, okay, we understand economia. We understand economia, and that's fine. Okay. But again, this controversy took 70 years. That split the holy mountain. And it was just about changing the memorial service by a few hours. But the traditional monks, they saw this innovation as bound, bound down to worldly affairs, putting the doctrine and putting the tradition of the church, putting the men before the tradition of the church. And of course, they said, wait a second, how can we have Sunday is a day of joy, is a day of the resurrection. And now on Sunday, we're going to have these memorial services when women, and back then, they used to wail, they used to pull their hairs. We don't see that now because we are calloused. But 40, 50 years ago, when you were at a funeral, you know, uh, there would be screams and shouts and people would be pulling their hair. It was terrible. And St. Nicodemus says, no, this cannot happen in church on a Sunday. This is not permissible. And this is why they were fighting, not because of a little bit of time change, but it was inappropriate to have all this take place in a church during the time, of, during the resurrection of Christ, which is a, a uh, day of joy. So very quickly, uh, this feud began to spread, and the main, the main of uh, among the Codivades. By the way, St. Nicodemus wasn't even there. St. Nicodemus was still a child, was five years old when all this took place. He was in Paros. But this feud continued for 20, 25 years. And as I said, what happened was Mount, uh, Holy Mountain split in two. And uh, this was not a, uh, not a very good time was not peaceful and the traditional monks they were actually chased off their holy mountain they left most of them those some of them stayed but a lot of them left and by the grace of god after they left they took the traditional spirit of the church the jesus prayer the theology of saint Gregory palamas the remnant this is the remnant. They took it all over Greece. They built monasteries in Chios, and that's where St. Nectarius went, and all these beautiful monks and saints that we had in Chios, they are from the work of the Colivades. The same thing in Paros. They went to Paros, they went to Naxos, and they went to Skiathos, and they built monasteries and churches, these monks from Mount Athos that were exiled. And this by itself gave a rebirth to Greece where all these people now, they had spiritual fathers, and St. Cosmas the Aetolian prepared all these people uh, for the liberation of Greece, where he, he built 200 schools. It was during that time, a little bit before this. And lo and behold, his brother, his brother, St. Cosmas the Aetolian, his brother was the teacher of St. Nicodemus the Hagrite in a school of Smyrna. St. Nicodemus was born in uh, 1749. He went to... Professor, be one of the teachers. Unfortunately, there was a war between uh, Turkey and Russia at the time. The Turks retaliated because they lost the war. Uh, the, their ships were burned by the uh, Russians. And then they retaliated and they began to destroy Smyrna, burn and kill a lot of the Christians. So St. Nicodemus left and by the grace of God, he had, got back to Naxos. 
for at the age of 21, he became the secretary of the bishop there. But some of the Kolivadas already were working on that island. And when he met them, within a year or two, he decided to become a monk and he went to Mamathos. When he went there, then uh, after a little bit of time, another, the, uh, the organizer of the group, a great personality, a great saint, uh, Saint Makarios of uh, Corinth. He was a metropolitan because, but after the the uh, the war with the Turks, you know that little battle that they had with the uh, with the Russians, he took, he voiced his opinion and he took the side of the Russians. The Turks said, get rid of him immediately. So he was sent into exile. He lost his throne. And after that, he just devoted himself to monasticism and to publications. So he went to Mount Athos and there he met uh, St. Nicodemus, which he had met him before as well. So here we have Makarios, who's a great scholar, brilliant and a very holy man, a metropolitan, who's taken his time to search the best transcripts in Mount Athos and everything he finds, he hands it over to Saint Nicodemus, who has a photographic memory. He is brilliant, he knows five, six languages. And Saint Nicodemus is simply cleaning up all these transcripts and they are uh, getting them ready for publication. They publish over 100 books. They publish, they publish Philokalia. They publish Evergetinos. They publish Synaxaristis, the Pivalion. They cleaned it up. They didn't write them. They simply, they got all these manuscripts together and St. Nicodemus corrected them. He fixed some errors and uh, he organized them and they were sent out for publication. And this St. Nicodemus was respected even by the anti Colivades, who were so upset when his book came out this book came out about taking Holy Communion uh, very often initially I heard from my spiritual father in Greece that Saint Nicodemus did not even put his name on it they published it anonymously because it would, it, they, it would have been it, uh, their life would be in danger, and not only that, but also it would have been totally discredited <clears throat> because the other, the anti Colivades were more numerous and obviously a lot more passionate about things and not as forgiving. <clears throat> the tradition back then was for people to take communion two or three times a week and of course this is wrong and St. Nicodemus by using the church fathers and the uh, liturgics and teachings of the church in this book he begins to convince people that we really need the medicine of immortality and we need to commune much more often. So again this publication went all over Greece and with all the other publications, a lot of the Greeks, not only the Greeks, but this movement, the Kolivadic movement, spread to the Balkans and even to Romania and Russia with Paisios Velikovsky, who came to Mount Athens to become a monk. But when, I guess during his feud, he was a little bit dis disenchanted, and, uh, but he was taught enough. And when he saw the Philokalia, and some of the writings of St. Uh, Nicodemus, he took all this and he translated it into Slavonic and into uh, the, the Russian people and also the Romanians had this great wealth of the church, which was the nectar of the church for like 14, 15 centuries. St. Paisios Velikovsky had over 1,000 monks practicing the Jesus prayer during this time. And St. Nicodemus, who loved monasticism, was so humble. He said, you know what? I really need to leave. He wanted to leave Mount Athos to go and be a disciple of St. Paisios Velikovsky. 
and somehow the Panagia didn't leave him, <laughs> uh, leave the holy mountain who was needed there. <clears throat> but this is the great work of the Kolivadas. The Kolivadas, they defended the traditional side of the church. They defended the faith of the prophets, the faith of the apostles, and they fought the secular spirit. They fought the spirit of innovation. Because the secular spirit destroys the church. St. John and Chrysostom says the greatest, the greatest enemy of the church is ekosmikipsis, materialism, ekosmikipsis, to become one with the world. The church understands the world, it's here to make the world to turn the world into a church and not vice versa if the church becomes like the world then it will lose the truth and it will lose christ saint john says in his epistles do not love the world or anything in the world and he who loves the world the love of the god is not the love of god is not in him so lately, we're hearing about love for everyone. Of course we love everyone. We love everyone, we love our people. But we don't love them more than Christ and more than the truth. We love our neighbor. We love our neighbor, but we don't love them more than the truth. The way you are acting right now for the last three months as a church, we are perpetuating humanism, the humanism, the humanism of the West. This is what we're doing. In the last three months, we put aside everything and all the tradition of the church for the sake of men, so our fellow men doesn't become infected. We put aside the doctrines of the church, all the tradition of the church, as I mentioned last week, about the uncreated grace of God, and about the idea that material things cannot be sanctified. But that's Barlamism. This is exactly what the West teaches, that matter cannot be sanctified. Then what are the bones or the relics of, of, of the saints? That's what the West believes. Vasily, the Pope in Rome, I don't know if it's in Rome, or they have the skull, the cara of St. Peter up high, like in a museum. And by the way, the first one to build a museum during Renaissance was the Pope. The first one. He brought all these statues and the Michelangelo here and all that. Okay. So the skull of Peter is up there. And when you go and say, listen, bring it down so we can venerate it. No, 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 it has to stay up there. Doesn't serve any purpose. It's just a piece in a, in a religious museum. That's all it is. Because they don't believe that grace is uncreated but if grace is created then yes you can get sick if you're in a protestant church if you take uh, if you take if you go into any kind of a church that has not been sanctified and you you're you know you you drinking grape juice with the same cup i can understand it and we, didn't, we don't expect the political authorities to understand this. They're not theologians. But we expect the leaders of our church to teach this and say that our faith is the church of Christ. It's that we are the body of Christ. And we believe that the body of Christ 
And the blood of Christ has the ability to sanctify matter. The garments of Christ healed that woman with the issue of blood. It wasn't his hands that healed her. It was just his clothing that touched her. And the shadow of Peter, not even his clothing, just the shadow of Peter healed people. And the handkerchiefs of, the handkerchiefs of St. Paul. So this is our faith which teaches that we can commune with the uncreated grace of God. That's what grace means. Grace is the Holy Spirit. It's the energy of the Holy Spirit that sanctifies our holy water, that sanctifies our baptism funds. If that energy is just material, and what sanctifies it? So we are in this crisis today, once again, I believe, because we have reduced ourselves to some rational thinking. And the rational thinking says that since most people are afraid to come in our churches and take Holy Communion, if we don't cater to them, then they may be disenchanted and we may lose them. But this has been tried before. This experiment has been tried before by all the Protestant churches, by all the other churches. They have tried to make mega churches and bring 18 bands into it. They tried to change everything. Is there world more Christian today? Because all these Protestant churches, they modernized them. They brought in the best bands. They, they catered down to the people. They have homosexual marriages. They, everything goes. Has that made us more holy as a country? When I was in England 10, 15 years ago, half of the churches were empty and they were being sold to become mosques. Because they lost, they lost the grace. Grace will not come by being reasonable and using humanistic means and rational thinking doesn't work. Our faith does not work by math. One plus one plus one is three. And that's what Aristotle couldn't understand. Aristotle couldn't understand that one plus one plus one is, zero, is one. God's math is very different than the math of the world. And this is exactly what the Kolivada's fathers tried to impress upon us and pass down the traditions that we have today. And just to give you an idea, these Kolivadas fathers, the remnant of that work that was found by Joseph the Hazekast and the Hagarites that were trained by Saint Joseph and St. Nectarius, and all these other saints that we had in the last century in Greece. And that work came into this country about 35 years ago through our blessed elder, our holy elder, Yelanda Ephraim, who renewed orthodoxy in this country. St. John I'm sorry, Father John Romanides made a prophecy about 20 years ago. Not much longer than that, I'm sorry, I'm a little tired. About 40, 50 years ago, when he was expelled from Holy Cross because he was very patristic along with um, Florovsky. 
and he went to Greece and he helped our Greek theologians there. But he said that unless we have traditional orthodoxy here, taught by true monks, we will become the unia of Protestants. This is what he taught. unites ton protestandon. In other words, we will become like Greek Catholics. On the outside will be Orthodox, but on the inside will be Protestant and humanist. And in the last 30, 35 years, we had a resurgence with a monastic movement, the 18 monastery that came into this country. And thank God for that, because thousands, thousands of us have found the truth have been helped and are trying to stay alive by practicing the undying traditions of our eternal church, which is led and will continue to be led by the Holy Spirit of God until the ages of ages. Amen.